this is one of those bits of the Bible that you get to the end of it and you're like, why did I just read that? Because to be honest, it doesn't seem to have a whole lot to do with anything. In fact, it is, both chapters, they are um, addressed to somebody that nobody knows who it is. And you might say, all right, so I can see prophecy where you know who it's addressed to and you get to see, you know, God's authority over history, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But why pay attention to a passage addressed to Gog of the land of Magog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, when no one has the first idea who that is? So let's go back over what we do know. If you go back, way, way, way back to Genesis, Chapter 10, you will find a list of Noah's son's offspring. And under the name Japheth, you will find Magog, Tubal, and Meshach, among others. So all we know from that, though, is that they were descended from Japheth and that they settled along the coastlands. So we're talking like Mediterranean coast, up and around, islands, whatnot. The only other time that these names are mentioned is actually earlier in Ezekiel, in chapter 27. I'm sure that the lament for Tyre is still vivid in your memories, but I'll go back and remind you just in case. They were talking about different allies of Tyre, trading partners, army partners, all of whom brought Tyre prosperity. And in the middle of this, you find chapter 27, verse 13, Javan, Tubal, and Meshach traded with you. They exchanged human beings and vessels of bronze for your merchandise. So we have the neutral, they settled around the coastlands, and then we have the not so neutral, they traded in human trafficking and were craftsmen in bronze. And now we come to this two chapter long passage dedicated to the chief of these lands. And all of God's people said, why? <laughs> but think about this though. From what it says, and I'll read you a couple passages, I won't go through the whole thing, try your patience that far. The description of them. It talks about clothed in full armor. This is chapter 38, starting in verse, latter part of verse four. Full armor, a great host, all of them with buckler and shield, wielding swords. He has allies, Persia, Cush, Put, we're talking about modern day areas, Iran and Ethiopia and Libya, and all of them with shield and helmet. Uh, Gomer and all his hordes, and if anyone just thought Shazam, no. <laughs> we are talking about more or less modern Turkey. So Anatolia area, uh, Beth Tagarma, which is uh, Syria-ish, somewhere north of modern day Aleppo, they think. Many peoples are with you. So we have this massive army and it's coming from two directions, from the south, from Africa, and from the north, from the southern half of, you know, southern part of Europe into the Near East. And what are they doing? They are marching upon the mountains of Israel. Now, last week we talked about a prophecy to the mountains of Israel. And in that prophecy, God is saying, when 
you have run the course of your discipline. I am going to restore you for my name's sake. So this is a newly restored land. And he, he describes it as that. In the latter years, you will go against the land that is restored from war. The land whose people were gathered from many peoples upon the mountains of Israel. And they now dwell securely, all of them. And the description here is this peaceful land, restored from war, and an advancing horde. It says, coming on like a storm, you will be like a cloud covering the land. I don't know if any of you have ever lived in a place that is prone to heavy fog, but that's kind of what I picture here. That they cover the ground like a heavy fog. You, you, can't, you can't see anything for the armies. So this is, this is my first hint that God might not actually be talking to the nations themselves so much as he's talking to the people they march against. And a lot of people get sidetracked by the identity question. Who are these people? When is this going to happen? And what it comes down to is there isn't really any point in speculating. What is known is enough. And if this were just some obscure passage in the Old Testament, I wouldn't put so much emphasis on this. But there's another place where the names Gog and Magog appear in the Bible. And that's in Revelation chapter 20. Verses 7 through 10 where we read, when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and salt, where the beast and the prophet false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever. And there are people, there are an appalling number of people who get sidetracked trying to figure out who this represents, because they figure that everything, <laughs> they can't really know God's will through the book of Revelation, unless they know who everybody is and can pinpoint a timetable and a map. So that's why I'm leaning on this a little bit right now. In prophecy, there is a message. And I can guarantee you that message is never primarily about names and places and people and dates. Those are only to confirm the message. So if you go back to Ezekiel 38 and 39, you'll start to notice some things. Now we've left this at a rather ominous image of a people living at peace, finally restored after years of suffering and exile, and a threatening army surrounding them. Why would God do this to his people after he'd finally brought them back, restored them? And you see language here that does indicate that God is actively involved in bringing these armies out. If you look at chapter 38, verse 4, the first half says, I will turn you about and put hooks in your jaws. This is the same language they use when they're talking about 
God's authority over the monsters of the deep, the Leviathan, where he can, he can hook them like a fish and reel them in. And he's talking about this army in the same way. I will bring you out against my people. Last time we heard something like this, it was bad news for God's people that they had been so wicked that God was bringing upon them judgment in the form of an army. In that case, it was the army first of Assyria and then of Babylon. But here we have a different plan. If you skip down to verse 10, thus says the Lord God on that day, thoughts will come into your mind and you will devise an evil scheme. And this scheme is actually really nasty. It's like, I'm going to find the most unsuspecting, innocent, helpless people I can find. I am going to tear them to pieces and take all they own. And all of his allies are saying, ooh, sounds good. Cut. I, I want the cut of that. And so God tells Ezekiel, son of man, prophesy and say to God, thus says the Lord God. On that day, when my people Israel are dwelling securely, will you not know it? You'll come out of your place, out of the uttermost parts of the north, you and many peoples with you all of them riding on horses, a great host, a mighty army. You will come up against my people Israel like a cloud covering the land. And in the latter days, I will bring you against my land that the nations may know me when through you, O Gog, I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. And here begins a vivid, one might even say graphic, picture of destruction. We talk about earthquakes, torrential rains, pestilence and bloodshed, hailstones, fire, sulfur. And through all this, the refrain is, I will show my greatness and my holiness and make myself known in the eyes of many nations, and they will know that I am the Lord. When I read this, my mind immediately goes back to Egypt. Where it began with Pharaoh's refusal, and it ended with God hardening his heart so that he could show his power, show his glory in front of all the nations. Just remember, when the Israelites finally, finally made it to the promised land, what was it that Rahab said to them? We've heard all that the Lord your God did, and we're afraid. And here we have this again. And it's not just, not just natural disaster he's bringing. Because as we get into chapter 39, we find he's going again. Son of man, prophesy against God. Behold, I am against you, O God. It's like, what, are we starting over again? This is exactly what you said at the beginning of the last chapter. And again, it says, I will turn you about and drive you forward. In some translations, there's a note that says, drag you forward. <laughs> and bring you up. Strike the bow from your left hand. Make the arrows drop from your right. And you will fall. And we have this image that's uh, begun here and then carried on in more detail later, that he is setting a banquet table for all the wild animals, the carrion birds, the scavengers, the predators. He's saying, all right, I have an army here for you. Come and eat. Because they will all be struck dead and become a feast for wild animals. Now, we are not accustomed to the kind of battlefields that they would have known. I think probably the last time we had that kind of pitched battle was World War I. And at that point, I think there weren't any wild animals left to scavenge. There are stories from the Civil War where they, 
had issues burying the dead because the wild animals, particularly the wild pigs, got to them first. So we're not really familiar with this kind of gruesome graphic disposal method of armies, but this is what God is saying is going to happen to the enemies of his people. And that this is his hand that has done this. And not only that, he says, the people who live in the cities that you were about to attack, all Israel, they're going to go out and they're going to build their fires out of your weapons. And it says, for seven years, they won't need to go cut firewood. They'll have all of your weapons to burn. And mirroring this seven-year period where they will have plenty of man-made firewood, he talks about seven months that it will take to bury all the bodies. That there will be people assigned you look at chapter 39, verse 14, they will set apart men to travel through the land regularly and bury those remaining on the face of the land to cleanse it. Seven months it takes to bury all the dead. That's quite the army. But look what happened to them. This is where I start to see the message is not specifically for these nations, but for God's people. Because if you think what would have been going through your mind if you were part of the nation of Israel, newly restored to your land, living at peace, and you look out and you see this army. Not again would probably be the mildest way to put it. But then to see this army struck down and you'll notice it isn't, I will bring out my people Israel to do battle against you. It will be, I will destroy them in your sight. And as far as we can tell from the text, they didn't have to do a thing. And there are certain things that we should probably notice about the character and the actions of God through this. The first one being that God is sovereign over the armies of nations, not his own. He will use them for his own purposes. Something that Israel experienced multiple times to their detriment but in this case, the promise is it's for your benefit. He will bring out the armies of these nations and he will destroy them. Who is left then to threaten Israel? Nobody from the south. Nobody from the north. None of these powers can stand against the will of the Lord. We also see that even the thoughts and the plans of humanity are known by God and even directed by him, unbeknownst to the people who think that they are thinking their own thoughts and making their own plans. He is taking their thoughts and using them for his own purposes. And another thing we find is, go to the end of chapter 39. He is jealous for his reputation, but also for his people. And that suggests to us something also. What should we be concerned with? If we are to be concerned with what God is concerned with, his reputation, his kingdom, ought to be foremost. And when we get down to the very end of the chapter, they shall forget their shame 
and all the treachery they've practiced against me. When they dwell securely in their land with none to make them afraid. When I have brought them back from the peoples, gathered them from their enemies' lands, and through them have vindicated my holiness in the sight of many nations. Then they shall know that I am the Lord their God, because I sent them into exile among the nations and then assembled them into their own land. I will leave none of them remaining among the nations anymore, and I will not hide my face anymore from them when I pour out my spirit upon the house of Israel. It's very much an echo of Job's words. The Lord gives, and the Lord takes away. In this case, the Lord exiles and the Lord restores. And he will pour out his spirit upon his people. In the early days, that was only known by a few and for short periods of time. But there's no limit given here. Not a certain kind of person, not for a certain period of time, but that he will pour out his spirit on his people. We looked at that earlier. The inward restoration. And it's something that we need to be seeking every day multiple times a day, that the Spirit of the Lord will be renewed in us again and again and again, because we are such cyclical creatures that we are close, and then we're far, and then we're close, and then we're far. And you know that's how it goes. We tend to think of it as highs and lows, but it's more like, you know, like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but the desire to be ever closer, to know his spirit and have his spirit at work in us. It's part of the promise. He promised it to his people Israel. The fulfillment of it is in Christ. Part of my readings this week, I, I, I hate to say it coincidentally because I don't really believe that, Part of my readings this week have been in Ephesians. We made it through Galatians and we talked about, you know, <laughs> if you started in the spirit and now you're trying to continue in the flesh, what's the point? But now we've hit, you know, this is our inheritance. And you are sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, the guarantee of your inheritance, until you acquire possession of it. And you know, we are still waiting for full possession of our inheritance. I always think about that when I'm watching the Christ in the Passover, when they get to the end and they say next year in Jerusalem. We have a Jerusalem waiting for us, promised to us. But we haven't got it yet. But through the Spirit, we are promised we will be renewed inwardly again and again and again, however many times it takes. So that when the day comes, we will be prepared. And in that day, we won't be cyclical anymore because the presence of God will be immediate among us, right in front of our faces. No way to get distracted. I'm looking forward to that. Hope you are too.
So I tried to keep this under half an hour so that, you know, you travel time just in case. But this is kind of what we're going to be doing from here on out. We have one more week, one more week in Ezekiel. And then I have something special for you. Last year, in our summer quarter, we looked at the character traits of Christians. This year, we are going to be looking at the tools to develop those character traits. Spiritual disciplines, scriptural meditation, prayer, fasting, community and solitude, all sorts of very interesting things. So that will start when we go into July. Hope I'm ready. 